Hi. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about behavior and about ABA. Um, so I just wanted to, this is what we did kind of in the last session. I just wanted to make sure, first of all, everybody knew if they had to go to the bathroom or if their child needed them or something happened to please leave. Hopefully you know where the bathrooms are. Um, hopefully we won't have a fire drill. I don't have to give you any egress instructions or anything like that. Um, but another thing I'd like is that we're going to, I'm going to go over a bunch of information, but there's going to be a part, especially in the middle, where we're going to talk about behaviors and specific behaviors, behaviors that might be just specific to your child or to your um, person who got you here. So I want to make sure that you feel free to ask questions or if any of the information is um, confusing to you, just interrupt me and ask questions. I'd rather it be more of a dialogue. I may ask you some questions. Um, but go ahead and raise your hand, and uh, I think we have to say we are recording this, is that correct? And it's live stream, so just understand that other people might hear your questions as well. Um, I'm going to give you a little, as she gave you, a little background on me. I guess what you're trying to say, I have a, a bachelor's degree in technical theater. That was my first, my first degree, and then I went into school for business, and then um, when my son was diagnosed with autism, I went back to school to become a behavior analyst. And, um, but my business degree and my behavior analysis degree actually aren't as disparate as you would think because I was in market research and we did a lot of research and I did a lot of translation of data. And that is what a lot of behavior analysis is about, is looking at the data and trying to figure out what is going on based on the data. So um, I did have that in my background originally. But um, I don't want to really stand up here and tell you about me, although you're welcome to ask questions. I do have a son with autism. He's 12. Um, and he's in regular school, he's doing great. I did watch him go through this therapy when he was two and, and was just so amazed by it that I couldn't not do it. Um, and I'm very excited that I did because I learned so much more about what the science of behavior analysis is. And that's kind of what I'm gonna talk about next. But first, I do wanna give a disclaimer that this is for informational purposes. I cannot treat your child from the front of this room. So please don't, don't expect me to. But I would like to answer questions and I definitely will talk about specific in scenarios um, and then at the end, I'm going to show you some resources how you can get a professional to come and help you if you have some behaviors that are really stumping you, especially ones that are dangerous. Um, also, I don't know everything. You know, sometimes we just have to try things out and, and see what the data show us. Um, so I couldn't do that from the front of this room. So I hope you didn't, you know, if you have specific something, this isn't really therapy. Um, but I do want to talk about situations, hopefully, that will help you. So first, I do want to do a very brief intro about what is behavior analysis. And does, you know, before I do that, is everybody familiar, have, have people heard of behavior analysis, applied behavior analysis or ABA? Some, some people have, some people, so, so I know there's some pre preconceived motion, notions out there. I'm going to try and explain sort of in a nutshell what it is um, and maybe dispel some of the myths that are out there about behavior analysis. But first and foremost, Applied behavior analysis is a science. It is the science of behavior or derived from the principles of behavior. And this is really important. This is, we don't just say, hey, I've got a bunch of tricks that seem might th like they might work with your child. We really go back into the science of why this behavior is happening and what is going on and, and what history has told us and what the history of, of your child versus the history of all mankind and rats and pigeons have told us and things like that. So it's very much a science, and I very much consider myself a scientist who takes data and does research and that sort of thing. The term applied just means that we are applying this science in the real world. So we have another branch of the science called EAB, or Experimental Applications of Behavior, Experimental Analysis of Behavior, and um, a lot of those people will work in laboratories, sometimes with pigeons and rats, sometimes with people, other things, um, and that's where the principles maybe come out from. We really work hand in hand. We're, we're definitely a team with the, the EAB folks. Um, we need them to do what we're doing, and they need us to have a reason to do <laughs> um, what they're doing. But, but as an applied behavior analyst, I work out in the field with real people. I mo mostly work with adults right now, but I've um, done a lot of work with children as well. Uh, a ABA is used to improve socially significant behavior. And this is important because um, sometimes I'll get calls or people will ask me, oh, my child stims and I don't like it when they stim. I'm like, well, is it really, is it keeping them from accessing the community? You know, is it keeping them from getting friends? Is it keeping them from doing things? Um, just because it's a behavior that's annoying to you 
we're not necessarily going to treat it. It's got to be something that's socially significant, that really makes an impact or makes a change in that person's life for the better, that lets that person access the environment better or have a better relationship, those kinds of things. And we employ experimentation to identify the variables that are responsible for improvement. Because I might just try a bunch of things and go, well, something worked. I don't know what it is. No, I'm really going to systematically go through and try and figure out what the function of that behavior is, why that's going on, what, you know, what we can do to, to make it better so that we really know what variables are affecting that behavior. So when somebody says, well, what's the difference between ABA and psychology? Or what's the difference between ABA and behavior modification? Um, the easiest thing for us to do is to go back to this, which is from a paper in 1968 by Werewolf and Risley about the seven dimensions of ABA. So if something is going to be ABA, because there are a lot of imposters out there, or there are a lot of people who say, yeah, I do ABA, or ABA is this, um, this is what it really is. So in order for something to be applied behavior analysis, it's got to be applied, right? because it's applied behavior analysis, that means it's got to be important to society or, or doing something in society. It's got to be behavioral. There has to be a focus on what a person does. I'm not going to talk very much about emotions or how a person's feeling. It's really, I'm talking about things that I can physically see, behavior that I can physically see happening. Not that there isn't behavior that's happening internally or what we would call private events. Those are important too, and we do treat those. But really, um, my powers of observation are the most important for me. I've got to be able to see the changes and the effects. Analytic, there has to be a believable demonstration of the events responsible for the behavior, or it's not ABA. Like, I really need to know, OK, this is what happened here. And the reason I know this is because I tried it several different ways, and it didn't work this time, and it did work this time, and these are the different variables. So that's where the analysis comes in. And we do do quite a bit of data analysis and look at a lot of data to get to the, where we need to be. Um, technological. It's very important that we're technological. It's very important that we describe everything that we do because then you want to replicate it or somebody else wants to replicate it to see if it can work in another situation. Um, and also, we just kind of keep ourselves buttoned up, making sure we're doing everything. We're, we're controlling the variables that we need to control. Conceptual systems is important. That brings us back to our EAB folks and that um, they're telling us the principles or the principles that Skinner came up with or Watson came up with years and years ago. Um, and then we're, we're going back to those principles, that we're using those principles to guide our interventions. Um, ABA must be effective. If it's not effective, then we can't be doing the tactics that we're doing or the interventions that we're doing, right? We've got to switch. We've got to do something else. If it's not effective, that means we've got the wrong function or we've got the wrong intervention, um, and we shouldn't be doing that. So, um, sometimes people say, oh, ABA doesn't work. I'm like, well, how can it not work? If it's not working, it's your tactics that aren't working. Or maybe your therapist is not doing a good job. But if it's not working, then we've got to figure out what about it is not working and change it so that it does work. And finally, it's got to be uh, generality, um, meaning that the changes are durable over time. But also, um, behavior analysts tend to not have like an office where we see a child face to face because if I can, I can get a behavior in that office, fine, but what really matters is what's going on in the community, what's going on when you go to the park, or what's going on in your home. So I'm much more likely to be in your home or be in the community with your child or your adult or, or um, you know, at the job or somewhere where these behaviors are really happening, where it's really important. And those are the seven dimensions. And I always make my, my people who I supervise rattle those off, so <laughs> they've got to memorize them. I know there are a lot of myths out there, so I'm going to take just a minute to talk about what ABA is not. Um, the first thing it is not is only a therapy for kids with autism. We are often linked with autism, and I don't know, is there anybody here who actually has a child with autism? Because I hear that there's sometimes people who are multiply di diagnosed. Okay, and the last one we had some, some comorbid situations here. But it's not about autism. The autism people are very loud and they get um, legislation done, which is how we're linked with autism. The other reason we're linked with autism is because, as we'll talk about, um, with applied behavior analysis, we look very much at the motivation of the person that we're treating. And um, do we, let me take a, a little bit of a survey. Um, who has a child who has Moat Wilson syndrome? Like a child like younger than 18, great. Who is an adult? And are you both, or are you just, you, you just the adult? <laughs> okay, I'm going to talk mostly about children's and, child, but, but, uh, children and children's behavior, um, just because it seems like the most of you have children, and that, that's the most effective. But um, everybody, everybody does stuff. Everybody has behavior. Um, everybody. doesn't matter who you are. So really, these principles apply to everybody and everything. 
Um, there's, a, as a matter of fact, applied behavior analysis is a very broad field. Um, we do stuff in uh, corporate, the corporate world, and animal behavior, and um, gambling, and casinos, and forensics, and things like that. I mean, it's, it's a huge field outside of just disabilities. But it's not only a therapy for kids with autism. The reason, my thought behind why it's linked with autism, well, there's a study in the 80s by uh, Lovas that, that really linked it with autism. But children with autism are notoriously difficult to reach because of their motivation. Their motivation is different. And, and with um, behavior analysis, we're absolutely looking at their motivation and what is reinforcing or what is punishing for that child. Um, and so that's the same with everybody. Like, I would never want to treat all children with a certain disorder the same, because it's not gonna work. Not all children are not the same. All children are different. And um, so using the, the therapy and the stuff with the applied behavior analysis, we get to that very individual motivation. And I think that's why it was linked with autism, just because they were so difficult to treat in the beginning. But like I said, um, really anything, any behaviors that you have going on, we can look at the effects of it, we can look at the science behind it, doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. Uh, ABA is not undemonstrated and unscientific. I always think that's interesting when I hear that because it's really the most research <laughs> intervention out there. If you look up research on ABA, don't read it all because you won't be able to get through it. It's, it's, over, it's overwhelming. Um, we're also not solely behavioral um, focused. Um, ABA is a science, like I said, that can be applied to many areas. And a lot of times, you know, we're reinforcing behaviors, meaning skills. We're teaching new skills. So there's an educational aspect to it as well. Um, and we're not training kids to be robots and not creative thinkers. I think we hear that sometimes. Um, we're going to incorporate generalization and social behavior into any program. No ABA program should just be your child sitting at a desk one-on-one -on -one with a therapist all day long. That's, that's not ABA. That is called discrete trial training. Actually, that's my next thing. That's one tactic. That's like one food. Onion rings are really yummy. You know, discrete trial training is pretty good tactic. Onion rings also really yummy. You could not live on onion rings, right? You gotta eat more foods. Same thing with ABA. We gotta use more tactics. It's the science is what drives us, not just that tactic. If that tactic's gonna teach you that skill, then it's important to use it. But it doesn't define what the science is or what the field is. We're not punishment focused. That's another thing that I hear that kind of makes me um, confused because uh, actually we, and I'm going to talk a lot about reinforcement, we would prefer not to focus on punishing because if I'm punishing a behavior, and, and by punishing, I'm, I'm going to clinically define it a little later, but by punishing I mean having that behavior decrease in the future, I haven't really taught you anything. In order to get a behavior to decrease in the future, I'd much rather teach you a better behavior or something else to replace it with than I would to just punish a behavior. Uh, very few behavior analysts focus on punishment. Sometimes we have to get down to punishment because everything else we've tried is not working. But um, it is never the first place we go. And it's not using bribes either. I'm not going to negotiate. We're setting up the contingencies of behavior that are there. Um, it's not bribing kids. We're going to talk a little bit more about how to use reinforcement effectively a little later. But uh, that too is not, as is, is a misnomer, it's not really what's going on with behavior analysis. So hopefully I'll explain all of that. But you don't have to take my word for it. Here's some a couple of research, the, the Surgeon General and the New York State Department of Health, the Center for Disease Control and American Academy of Pediatrics. But like I said, there's research upon research upon research that I couldn't even begin to, to go to. Um, the last thing I do want to emphasize, and I said this again with the seven dimensions, but really ABA should be self-correcting. Self if it's not, you're not getting it correctly. <laughs> um, but as if the data are not showing us what we want to see, if the data, or if the behavior is not changing, if we're not getting, if, if it's getting worse, for heaven forbid, or if it's not changing, then we're not doing it right. We've got to change what we're doing so that it is correct. And we're going to talk a little bit more specifically about kind of how we do that. So today we're going to talk a little bit about behavior because you've got to know something about behavior in order to talk about behavior. Um, we're going to talk about the functions of behavior. I'm going to spend most of my time in that section. And at that time, I'm going to ask you guys for some examples of things that you're seeing. And maybe we'll talk about what function that behavior might have, leading to what intervention that um, you could get from that. We're going to talk about consequence strategies. So intervention consequence is what comes after. We're going to talk about antecedent strategies. Those are strategies that come before. And then, like I said, because I cannot treat your child from the front of this room, even if you ask me very detailed questions, I'm going to give you some resources on how to find a behavior analyst in your area who may be able to help you with something that's a little more difficult. All right, so let's talk about behavior. Behavior 
is defined as the activity of living organisms. So basically anything somebody does is behavior. So anything that a person does. So if it's a pumpkin, so a lot of times people use the dead man test, but I think pumpkin's a little nicer, and there's a picture. If it's a pumpkin, if it can do it, like sitting still, that's not really behavior, right? Or thinking, that's not really behavior unless there's some sort of active thing going on. There, is, there are some private events with reading or, or, or thinking or, or um, speaking or things like that um, that maybe you can't see. Just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's behavior. But it still needs to be something that a person does. And, and it's better if it's something that's observable. This is our three-term contingency. So this is one really important, um, I think, factor in behavior analysis that I want everybody to be familiar with. Every behavior that a person does um, has an antecedent, that's something that happened before, and a consequence, that's something that happened after. The antecedent is not the cause of the behavior. Sometimes you'll say, well, what was the antecedent? And they'll say, well, I don't know why they did it. I'm like, but that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking what was the environment prior to the behavior? And then the consequence, the consequence is really important. We're gonna talk about those strategies first. The consequence is what determines whether that behavior will happen more often in the future or less often in the future or has no effect. So it's the consequence that maintains behavior and that's really gonna be a big focus today. So examples here, like the antecedent would be mom turns her back and then the behavior is the brother hits a sister and then the consequence is the sister cries and maybe the crying you know, could decrease or increase the behavior in the future. Probably brother thinks sister crying is kind of funny. Maybe he'll do that behavior more often. But the antecedent being the signal, mom's turned her back, I know I can get away with this behavior. Another one is mom is on the phone, the child screams, and then mom gets off the phone and yells at the child. Those are kind of things that happen. So I'm just, I'm just giving you examples of sort of behavior chains. Here's an educational one. The teacher says, touch your head. The child touches their head. The teacher says, good job touching your head. Something to that effect. Um, so that's our three current contingency, and everything that we're going to talk about from that is going to be built on that. But I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, pretty easy. There are three things that I'm going to show you. This slide is going to come up, I think, a couple more times in the presentation, because if you take away nothing else, um, this is what I'd like you to know. First of all, behavior, remember, is anything a person does. It's not bad. Right? A lot of times people think that behavior is just bad. Um, sometimes when I worked in clinics, I would have people say, you know, they'd hand off a clipboard or something and, and go on to the next kid. Oh, we didn't have any behaviors today. And I thought, oh my gosh, is he dead? Because if he's not having behaviors, that's a problem. And, and you know, that's me being cheeky, I know, right? But the point of it is, is if you are not noticing good behavior or you're not noticing the behaviors that we want, then you are not reinforcing them. So they're not going to happen more often. You can't just pay attention to bad behavior. If you do, you're going to keep getting it. You're going to keep getting the behavior that you don't want. So it's really important to understand that a behave, behavior is a, something a person does, not inherently good or bad. Two is that we'll talk about kind of what reinforcement is in a little bit. Um, but when you, when you use reinforcement, you reinforce behavior. We don't reinforce people. And the importance of that is timing. So if Johnny had a good day today, right, um, and I want to take Johnny out to dinner, I say, oh, I'm reinforcing Johnny's good day behavior. Well, I don't know that Johnny quite understands that he had a good day or what specific behavior he did that warrants going out to dinner. Johnny just knows he goes out to dinner. Could be that the, before you told him he's going out to dinner, he just hit his sister and you didn't see it. So now he's like, oh, I hit my sister and I go out to dinner. I mean, they don't, they don't, you don't necessarily know. So you've got to make sure that you're reinforcing behavior, the behavior that you see. And this is also important because if you have a child who maybe just had a tantrum and now they're not having a tantrum, I know you remember that tantrum. Like, and you're upset about your child having that tantrum and maybe you were in public and it, and it embarrassed you or you were a little happy. But you've got to not be looking at that behavior anymore. You've got to be looking at the behavior that's happening, right? So if now the child's calm, I'm going to maybe give the child attention or be excited about the fact that they're calm now, even though they had that tantrum behavior, and we can deal with that later. But, um, but it's very important that you re reinforce the behavior that's happening and not just say, oh, I'm going to give a reward or something after that. And the last one is when reacting to a behavior you want to decrease, you've got to think about the future. You can't just think about stopping this behavior I don't want. One classic example is the grocery store. So you've all seen, you've been at the grocery store and you've seen the kids in the carts and the kids crying, rah, 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 
da, and mommy gives the kid a lollipop and they stop crying, right? Problem solved, right? N no. We totally, what do you think is going to happen next time they go to the grocery store? That kid's going to cry because they totally got a lollipop out of it, didn't they? It's very important to understand the effect that you have on future behavior. So, um, you know, I might give the child a lollipop for not crying or for being, you know, for being good. But um, if I define that specifically, uh, we have to just make sure that we understand that even though you may stop an under, undesirable behavior right then and there, that's not actually solving your problem for the future. So those are, th we're going to go back over these again and talk about them as we go on. But those are three things that I really like people to know. So the functions of behavior. We're going to spend most of our time on this today, and this is where I'm going to want some feedback from you all. Um, there are only four functions of behavior. Four things that maintain behavior. And you're like, that's crazy talk because there have got to be a lot of things involved with the behavior. No. I defy you to find something that doesn't fit inside these four functions of behavior. Um, first, I want you to know, though, behavior in, inherently is communication. How many of you who have children or adults um, have children who are non-vocal, meaning they don't speak words? Yeah, like all of you? Right. I, know, I don't think you can see that. But everybody raise their hand. <laughs> um, yes. So if you think about that, you've got somebody who cannot communicate with you, right? Well, they're communicating with you through their behavior, through the things that they're doing. Because th imagine going to another country and not speaking the language at all, and you've got to eat, and you've got to get places, like what are you going to do? You try and find somebody who can speak your language, but if you can't, you're going to take things, or you're going <laughs> to maybe hit somebody to get what you want. I mean, imagine how horrible that is, not to be able to communicate, or to be able to have people understand you, or understand people. So, we do that through behavior, and that's what you're going to get. So, a lot of the things that you're seeing is really communication. But the four functions of behavior, I'm going to start over here, and um, in the last session we sort of identified that a lot of um, people with Moat Wilson syndrome really end up over in this, the, their behaviors end up in this place. So the functions of behavior could be, yeah, I know I'm a little close to the thing, um, direct or automatic access to something or direct or automatic escape. And by that I mean that it's not socially mediated. It's not anything that you're doing. So if I am chewing on my finger, I am doing so maybe because it tastes good. It just feels good. I, get, I like that feedback that my teeth get, right? Nothing to do with you. You can say something to me or not say something to me. I'm going to keep chewing on my finger because it feels good. Or it may be my finger hurts or something hurts, and chewing on the finger sort of alleviates that pain. That's escape. So it could either be access or escape. How many of you feel like your child has behaviors that fall under that category? Yeah, most of you, right? It's what people say is sensory seeking behaviors. And this is just how a behavior analyst kind of defines that. It's automatic or direct um, access or escape that function. So if this feels good, am I going to keep doing it? Uh-huh, right? Unless we replace it with something else that's, um, you know, or not. But I'm going to probably keep doing that. So the other side of the chart maybe is not where the behaviors start, the function of the behaviors, but sometimes the things that you do get the behavior to be maintained by these as well, or make these the function as well. And so we have socially mediated access, and by that I mean attention. So when I chew on my finger, you all of a sudden go, Johnny, stop chewing on your finger, right? You weren't paying attention to Johnny before, but now that he's chewing on his finger, you're like, you're now focused on him, right? So that you've added this attention that he wasn't getting before, does this behavior gets attention. So we may, you may move it or, you know, make it be multiply. Or it could be escape. So you say, put your shoes on. I don't want to put my shoes on. I might throw a tantrum, get on the floor and, you know, kick and scream or something like that. Um, am I putting my shoes on? Nope, I've gotten out of it. So that's, a, that's another example of escape. Do these behaviors look like behaviors maybe that you guys see? Okay. So let's talk, this is where, like I said, I want to spend a good amount of the time. Let's talk about these behaviors and maybe other ones that you see. Somebody give me, somebody raise their hand <laughs> and give me a behavior and let's talk about it and let's see if we can all together kind of figure out what may be the function. And again, we can't treat somebody we can't see, but we can guess it or try and go down the path that would lead us to more experimentation of what the function is. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, 
Uh huh. Dirty, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. He's going to. Sure. Right, right. The only problem, I think, with stopping a behavior is you haven't given him something to do instead. So that function or that need is still there. But now I've got no way of getting what I need, right? And I know I'm not supposed to do this because if I do, I might get punished, maybe. Or if you're not looking, I won't get punished, right? So if, I, so, if I just, so if I just use punishment, if I just try and stop a behavior, I'm not, I'm not going to get as far with it as if I try to replace it. So I would say that that's a little bit of both. Probably it started in that direct access. I'm playing with your genitals. I'm sorry, folks. That, that works with everybody, OK? Pretty much everybody's good with that. Um, you know, you learn not to do it in public. It's harder to teach somebody who's non-vocal not to do that in public. But there is some automatic reinforcement that we cannot compete with a lot of the times. That's, that's a very, very, very common behavior. And then when there's other stuff down there to play with, like that looks like Play-Doh but smells different, yeah. you know. <laughs> Goodness, look at all the fun I could be having. So um, that's, I mean, that's definitely, we think, probably a lot of it right here. Um, so right now, it looks like you used punishment, and I'm, not, and I'm going to define punishment more. Punishment just means something that you apply after the behavior, and the behavior in the future decreases. And a lot of times with punishment, it is temporary because, again, we haven't given him anything else to do. So other things that you might want to do is we'll figure out what it is. Again, there is that good feeling, right, of going on. So if we can find something else that is fun to do, um, but also gets a lot of attention and a lot of support and a lot of reinforcement socially so that we're, you know, we're in that other things because that's all I can do is add on to it that way. So instead of um, telling him not to put his hands down there or, or smacking him or something, tell him where to put his hands. Maybe he, maybe he uses a fidget spinner or maybe he plays with one of those squeeze balls. Or, and again, I don't know. This, it's got to be unique for your child. Um, but something else. And then when that's happened, I can pile on that also adult attention and go, I love how you're using your hands, you know, and, and more interaction of that sort of thing. So that there's something that trains that behavior to go elsewhere and still lets them know that, yeah, that's not socially acceptable. So like the changing time. Mm -hmm. the changing time. I would totally give him something in his hands. In his hands. Absolutely. Uh-huh. And he comes back to it. Yeah. And that's a side effect of punishment. Jewelry. Yeah. We call that jewelry. Mm -hmm. Same thing. So incompatible behavior is good with replacement. So if I've got, if I want to put my hand somewhere, I've got something, I can't play with a squeeze ball or, or do something with my hands that's going to maybe be reinforced, and also put my hands in my diaper. I can't physically do both, right? So if there was something that you could put in his hands to manipulate, um, and, and that, that, you know, if he manipulated it for a certain amount of time, or if it did something, if you got to a, a reward, that somehow you could reinforce that behavior, you would see, you could possibly see it morph into that. And that would be the replacement behavior. Does that make sense? I just want to say one more thing about the punishment thing. We do see that a lot. If you're just punishing the behavior and you're not giving an alternative, and granted, that's a strong reinforcer, right? That's fun. That's a really, so you have to find something more fun than that. There's not much that's really more fun than that. Um, He would know. That was when he moved over here. Yep. Yeah. 
Right. Oh, sure. And it's not about knowing, really. It's about, because you can know whether a behavior is good or bad, but it's really about what happens. Is that behavior working for you? And still that behavior is working for him. We've got to make it not so much work for him, but something else work for him better. Um, ABA. That he couldn't do it. Right, so he can't yeah. do it, but he did replace the behavior with the behavior. But he's not able to get. He can't get in, yeah. It's got to be kind of both. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And that's so, so it looks like you've got half of the intervention going, but not the other half. Right. And when you have a child, so there's, there, you've got to think about, too, there are different levels of um, cognition in children. There's some who understand more than others. If there's a way, too, that you can, um, if you, we call something a differential reinforcement of other behavior or the absence of behavior, basically, if you can go a certain amount of time without doing this, then something good happens. Um, there are things like that. But again, we've got to differentially reinforce something else. And incompatible behavior is the best, the easiest thing to reinforce. But there's got to be something else that, because it becomes a habit along with it feels good, it also becomes a habit. We've got to give him something else to do. Right, because he's doing something other. Yeah. Right. Sure. That's working for him. Uh-huh. Yeah, there, not causing any problems to the yeah. so That's good. I'm, I'm bathing, but should I, is that okay to let them do Yeah. Something? Be, so your kids. I mean, will they understand that there's a time to do that? Yes. That is called a discriminative stimulus. That's that antecedent part, and we will talk a little more about that. Your kids are incredibly smart. They know when to do stuff and when not to do stuff. Your kid knows it. He was going like this, right? He's looking over the teacher. He knows exactly what to do. They know when to do and when not to do. So I think, and actually that's a good thing because you can never absolute anything, right? Nothing can ever be never. There's always got to be a sometimes. So it's just about the conditions. You know, when the conditions are X, then you can do Y. But when the conditions are Z, we got to do something other than Y. And they pick that up. Every, even, even children with very low IQs, it doesn't, children with high IQs, it doesn't matter. That stuff, people learn to, con, con, to discriminate. You, you had somebody over, no, you changed your mind. She, she liked that behavior so much, she didn't want to talk that. Yeah, go ahead. What? There is, but that's not a sustainable, it's not really a sustainable intervention because you don't want him wearing onesies for the rest of his life. It's for right now, yes. It's a very good part of the intervention. Yes. Oh, totally. You have to have that intervention, but you've got to think about the future too. So that's an excellent antecedent strategy that's part of the intervention. You just need to follow it up with the other part of teaching a new behavior that replaces that behavior that you can then reinforce and continue with. Does that make sense? And then that one will go away. Yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> so maybe something, can, yeah. Uh-huh. Right. What happens when he throws it? You quit giving it to him. But do you say something to him? Yeah. So attention. If it's a tractor, you can do one or two of them. Uh-huh. By themselves and work on self-cleaning. Sure, great. And then about the second or third one, he just throws it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, we just say no, and then we just start feeding it. The thing about no, no is great if you think your child does not understand the direction. But after a while, you're pretty sure the child knows that they're not supposed to do it. So any no at that point is actually just attention. Um, it's not instructive anymore. 
So I'm not saying never to say no, but, but do understand that after a while all your no's are just really engaging with the child in a behavior that you don't want them to do because they know. They know the answer is no. It's not like, you know, the first couple of times maybe they don't realize they're not supposed to throw the cracker. But after a while, they get it. So your no is no longer instructive. It's then turned into kind of attention, which, which is what moves us over to this. And so when we have behaviors that are very strong and they're over in this side of the function, right, um, which a lot, I know a lot of your behaviors are really over there. The last thing we want to do is also give them this. Right? We don't want to increase the reinforcement for the behavior by any chance. So we do, I think you want to be very careful with understanding, and really, if you go out of here today knowing, not that you, you change even so much what you do, but if you understand what the effect of my behavior, what I, as the, the parent, am doing after a child's behavior, that that has an effect on their future behavior that I can affect the environment. Um, that doesn't mean you, might, you still might do it sometimes, and there are a lot of times where you have to do it anyway. You have to say no, or you have to, um, whatever you use for your discipline, just understand what it does to the future of behavior that might help you, you know, change up. Does that make sense to people? And that's really, that's really the it. This is, this is the chart. And I know it's like, and even the words I use, I, a lot of times when we're teaching, we had a, a lady in here who had just finished her master's in behavior analysis, and she's like, I'd never seen this chart. Um, we always just taught attention, escape, and then automatic reinforcement. And I, the reason I don't do it that way is I think that's simplifying it too much, and it's not encompassing everything. If you look at this chart and you think about every single thing that you do, or anybody else does, the function is there somewhere. There's nobody here who does things that it doesn't work for them. For very long. Maybe you'll do it a couple of times, and then you'll stop. Um, even if it's what you would say is intrinsic motivation, that's fine. That's how your motivation works. That's working for you, and that's why you're doing it. So if you need to change a behavior, understand that you still need those things, right? You need attention. You need to escape things that are too hard for you to do. You need to feel good. Or um, if you talk about this one, like the automatic escape, like my, my head hurts and I do this, I need to alleviate that pain, right? I need that. Um, this is an acceptable behavior, thank goodness. Like if banging my head also did that, not so much an acceptable behavior, right? Maybe I want to transfer it to this. But um, I need those things to happen for me. I can do some acceptable behaviors, behaviors that work for both you and me, that gets me there. And that's, that's kind of the, the magic bullet. If it makes sense. It sounds, um, and I'm definitely simplifying it more because once you get into things, it's harder. But really, that's what is going on. Does anybody, can anybody think of a behavior that doesn't fit into one of those four categories? Something that somebody does that doesn't fit there? I defy you. Sometimes I bring candy to reinforce them. Anyway, yeah? Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Spitting is a great one. Out? Drooling. Uh huh. So that's probably the. the what is it? I, I can't understand well, that's because you're not her, right? And, that, and that's that's the big thing. That's that. Yeah, I mean, that's it. The thing is, is what motivates me motivates does not motivate you necessarily, and that's what makes it so hard. Is because you try to think, well, that wouldn't feel good to me, but clearly it does. Or um, there may be something medical going on too that um, there, there's always, and we caution, I mean, I, I try to look at everything behaviorally, but there's always something, there, there's always a chance that there's like a medical issue, you know, um, that there's, she's making excess drool and she needs to expel it. So it might be here. It might be that there's excess drool in her mouth that she needs to get rid of, right? So that, that could be it. Um, I don't know, so there's some of those things. But, um, yeah, spitting is a very, when the spitting out, the spitting at people is a very different behavior than the, and, and would have a, probably a different function. And of course, the function would just be so dependent on who you were and what was motivating you. Does that make sense? So I think in that case, I'd try and figure out what it is. If she's having excess drool, is there something like a spray or something that can help? Or is it, you know, jewelry or things like that that can help? Or um, you may want to help, like maybe a medical professional can get involved in that. If it's just, I'm so used to doing that and it's kind of a habit now, then um, maybe you give her an incompatible behavior with drool. Like, um, 
breathing techniques or something where you can't, and I don't know what her cognition level is, but there, there might be something that you can do other than that that then you could reinforce, socially reinforce. Again, your reinforcement's over here, which may not be as powerful, but it's still something that works. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think, unfortunately, um, a lot of our kids have gotten free access to those toys all the time so that it is a punishment when you take it away rather than it being something that they earn, in which case, you know, they've done something and they earn it, that'll get, but, but at this point, if you switch to that, it would still be punishing because, uh, no, I get, that, I get the toy anytime I want. Why would I not? And, it's, and that, those electronic toys are very powerful. There's a lot of stuff going on, you know, that is giving you that um, ad automatic access that is reinforcing those be that behavior, playing with the, the toys and things like that. Um, so if there's a way you can slowly, huh? Well, no, yes, in a way. I mean, I think what you need to do is slowly switch over to more of a you earn the game versus it's just always there for you. So if you make it more, and you can't do this, you can't overnight it, go, nope, now you're only earning it. That is not going to work for you. <laughs> um, what, but if you can switch it slowly to, wow, you just, you know, you just really paid attention well there. Why don't you play your game for a little bit? Or, or, um, or even... If you can somehow make playing the electronic more fun if you're involved, that would be really great because then, yeah, like if, if, if you do, if you give me the icon or do whatever it is that I need you to do, and now I'm involved and we're playing the game together. And so not only do you have the game, but you've got daddy attention. Like daddy? Yeah, so daddy attention and, that, and that's better. Then you can transfer kind of that behavior. But yeah, when, if, if somebody has unfettered access to something, it's going to be very difficult. Then it's only punishment to take it away. Um, if, you, if I could have had, you know, given you a magic ball and you could have started in the beginning with, all right, we're going to you know, only give this sometimes, but you're not there. I think what you need to do is slowly try and turn it into you can earn time with this rather than uh, you always get this, and if I take it away, it's punishment. Right, but I get it all the time. That's not, you know, so it's a, so it's a, and rather than doing it as a, you're, you're giving the direction, I'm going to give it back to you when you do this, wait till he does this, and then um, try and pair it, what we would call pairing it, P-A-I-R, pair the, the electronic with, oh, you did great, you know, it, maybe he's not playing with it for one second or something. Good. Yeah, or somehow making it more, like, if you can, so if you think of water, running water, right, like, it goes the easiest track, okay, we call that the matching law, actually. Um, it's going to find the easiest way. So um, whatever the easiest way of getting what I want is the one I'm going to do, whatever that takes the least amount of effort. So if I can't change the effort, I mean, then sometimes I have to change, where, well, well, maybe you'll do a little more effort to get here, which is better than over here. You know, and that's that matching law, like we're trying to make this so much better so that the water is going to want to move here rather than this is not as good. I don't know if that helps, but, but that's a hard one, those electronics, and it's more of that unfettered, they, you're like, I get access, I get it all. So if you're taking it away, you're taking, you're taking away my right rather than it being, that's the mindset of it, you know? <laughs> yep, so it's about switching that. Uh, Okay, let's do, do you want to try one more before we move on? Or do you want to move on? I, got, I think I got myself in trouble last time. Oh, actually it's, oh, uh, well, okay, quick one, yeah. Chewing, yeah, chewing. <laughs> Except for food, oh, I'm so sorry. Chewing items, that's a big one, yeah. Um, and a lot of time is, again, trying to make that, that discriminative stimulus of you can chew this, not that. Um, and the way you do that, again, is not through punishment of when you chew something that's wrong, but more of, I'm much happier with you when you're chewing this. These are the few things that you can chew. Because that, I think that chewing behavior needs to happen. I think that's really part of the disorder. That needs to happen. I mean, they need that. You can't, so you can't stop it because that's just not fair, right? Mm -hmm. 
No, we don't want to chew on that. Straps in the high chair are pretty unhygienic. Um, I think I would try and morph it over to something that you have with it so that he's still getting that feedback, but it's something more appropriate. Um, and then you might even try, if you got somebody, this is conditioning. So you guys know about Pavlov, right? This is more of the conditioning end in Watson. Um, but if you think about if it's um, you're chewing a toy and then you've got a favorite toy and now, now you've morphed that behavior over to I really like to chew this toy and I don't chew my straps anymore, maybe you put a little strawberry jam on it. <laughs> and, then, and then you've paired that with like, oh yeah, all right, like chewing is good and I get a little of that strawberry flavor and oh, maybe I want to eat a strawberry now. You know what I'm saying? Um, I would do that with a professional if you could, um, rather than just although trying it, you know, I guess it's not too dangerous a behavior. But it's, again, about replacing kind of what, figuring out what it is they need, because they totally need what they need, right? They just don't need to get it sometimes in the way that they're getting it. Okay, I'd like to move on a little bit, but we can go back to more if we have time. I don't want to go over your time. I want to... So one thing that we do a lot of times, remember I tell you that behavior is communication. So I'm communicating to you through my behavior because I can't communicate to you in a different way. Um, so we want to try to teach you as much as possible to communicate. Like there are things that we call manding or requesting. That's the strongest. Um, that's the first place we usually start. Um, not always, not always, but sometimes when you have a child who doesn't speak or doesn't use a communication device, the first thing I'm going to do is teach them to request an item because then naturally they get that item, right? So that's pretty powerful. Okay, I say something to you or I, I use my, some communication technique and I get what I want. Woohoo, that's great, right? So that's where we'll start. Um, but so the more we can get people to communicate with us, the better. If it's through sign language, and I know there are a lot of motor difficulties, sometimes sign language is difficult. Although sign language is really great in terms of helping, like th there's a lot of research on motor skills and, and then being able to speak with the sign language. Um, assistive technology, if that's the way that's going to go. What I am not talking about is facilitated communication. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do would, would caution you to please look it up before you use it, or a rapid prompting method or something like that, um, where somebody is holding their arm and they're communicating in that respect, or they're holding a board and they're, because I don't always feel like it's then the individual that's communicating. It's a lot of times really the facilitator that's doing the communicating. And that's fine if we're going to, if we're going to move away from that, but that can't be the sole communication, and a lot of times it does that, gets you into a lot of trouble. So feel free to look that up on your own. But um, functional communication training, FCT sometimes, is a very important part. Because again, with you'll see some of those aberrant behaviors go away if I'm able to tell you what it is I want, right? So consequence is important because it's the consequence of what we apply after the behavior that determines whether that behavior will happen more or less often in the future, right? So reinforcement, these are the definitions of these words. Um, you can wow your friends at parties by actually knowing the right definition of these words. They're used very often incorrectly on television. So <laughs> if you watch sitcoms, sometimes behavior analysts groan, they're used incorrectly a lot. Reinforcement is something that comes after, I remember all these are consequence, after a behavior and that behavior increases in the future. And it could be that it's something I give you after the behavior, like I say good job, or it's something that I take away after the behavior, like you um, want to, uh, it's too noisy in here and I need to go, so I'm going to give the teacher a break card and the teacher takes you out. So my behavior of giving a break card is going to be reinforced, right? It'll happen more often. So reinforcement is when we apply something after the behavior and that behavior goes up. That's the definition of it. So if I, um, if I have a kid who, or a person or somebody who um, does something and I say good job and they never do it again, that was not reinforcement. I know you guys think good job should be reinforcement, right? In that case, didn't work. So it's defined by what happens to the behavior. The same thing as punishment. Let's say I spank a child, or, or let's say we say no and we hit the hand. If that behavior continues, that's reinforcement. That's not punishment, even though you think that's punishment, right? Not in the clinical sense of it. Punishment is when we apply something after or take something away after, and that behavior decreases, OK? So that's very, a very important distinction, because that's about knowing your child or knowing your adult. You're knowing your individual. You've got to know their priorities. Because if you don't understand the motivation and you're not tapping into their motivation, they're not going to learn the skill that you want them to learn because it doesn't mean anything to them, right? If, if I'm not getting, 
you know, if you're giving me social praise and I could care less what you think, I'm not gonna do it, right? But maybe I like that electronic device and I might do it for that and then I might build skills. So that's a really important part. Um, and I just emphasized it with this slide. So this is the graphic that might help you, right? So we've got the behavior and what happens after and, um, and so it, it, the effect on future behavior is what tells us what we describe it as. Oh, that was reinforcing because that behavior went up or that was punishing because that behavior didn't happen as often. Reinforcement is how we teach. Like we were talking about, I don't like to use punishment because um, I can't, because it's icky, <laughs> because um, I'm not teaching anybody anything, right? I haven't taught you a new skill, I've just told you what not to do and then you don't know what to do. It's like sitting still in church, right? Like I can tell my kid all the time to sit still in church, but they don't really know like what that means. But if I tell them to do something, I want you to read this passage in the Bible or I want you to sing or I want you to do something else, that's a lot easier. Um, so if I have something that I can, something physical I can see that I can reinforce, that skill is gonna be learned a lot better or that other behavior that we don't want is gonna go away a lot faster because I replace it with something. If someone's unable to learn a skill, it's usually for two reasons. One, it's too hard, you can't do it, right? It needs to be broken down. We'll talk about breaking skills down. It's just too hard, I can't do it. So if I'm not doing it, can't do it. Or the motivation's not strong enough. I just don't care what you're offering me or I don't care what I, I don't get anything out of doing this skill. Um, I'm gonna, I gave you, you guys can take pictures of this or something and look up this article later. This is a really great article and actually he has a better book um, called uh, Reflections, I think that's, no, it's like, I can't remember the name of the book. Oh, he's gonna, anyway. Um, he talks about punishment and coercion and how it really doesn't teach, like you may get rid of a behavior, it's very effective. It actually reinforces the punisher because you're like, oh, I think I've gotten rid of that behavior but then the behavior come back later, or you get some other side effects that maybe you don't want. And here's a note a little bit on the side effects. So again, it's only punishment if it affects the behavior in that way. And then even then, you might get other things like they don't learn a replacement behavior, they, um, there's a fine line between punishment and abuse. Um, those who are punished sometimes take it out on someone else. So um, that's why I'm going to talk mostly about reinforcement. Not that punishment doesn't have its place, it does. Sometimes you have to get people to stop doing what they're doing. So why isn't it working? You try something and you're like, why isn't it working? Well, you, you can think about the different things. If you're offering a reinforcer afterwards, maybe it's not a reinforcer. Again, maybe it's not something that the person cares about. Maybe it's not motivating. Or um, maybe if you're using tablet as a reinforcer, but your son gets unfettered access to the tablet, you know, I'm like, I can get that anytime I want. That's not really reinforcing, because I can get it. I'm not gonna work for that, because I can get it. Um, or immediacy, a lot of times, um, you, you're, the person did a behavior a while back and you're trying to reinforce it later and they don't understand what it was that they're getting, that the reinforcer's for. So having immediate reinforcement is better when you're using reinforcement. Size, um, maybe it's just not enough. You know, maybe it's not enough to make my water go this way. And contingency, um, if the, sometimes other behavior gets the reinforcer, then I might be confused and I might not understand exactly what behavior I'm supposed to do. So, the thing about reinforcement is that it works best when it's variable. Um, if I gave you a prize every time you did something, every time, then the second I didn't give you a prize, you would not do it. Like, you would only work for the prize. But if I make it variable, if you don't know when that cool thing is coming, like, I um, will call my kids every once in a while, and my oldest daughter's name is Ella, and I'll go, Ella, come here, and she'll come. Sometimes I'm like, I just wanted to give you this candy, <laughs> or I just wanted to give you a hug. Sometimes I'm like, I want you to do the dishes. <laughs> She doesn't know, she always comes, because she doesn't know what it's gonna be, right? It keeps them guessing, it's like slot machines, who plays the slots? Come on, nobody. We had one person fess up to it last time. Nobody plays the slots, sure. Um, anyway, if you've ever used a slot machine, there's people, they'll pull it. Um, if you got a prize every time, and then one time you didn't, well you'd stop, right? But because sometimes you get a really big payout, sometimes you get nothing, sometimes you get a little payout, you don't know, that's what keeps, I mean, that's a very strong, gambling's a very addictive behavior. It's a very strong behavior. It's that variability that keeps it going. Same thing with everything. So I'm not saying that you should reinforce every behavior that your child does, um, except at first, perhaps. If your child is learning a new skill that's really hard for them, speaking, walking, um, eating something like a cracker, you know, something, things that are very hard, in the beginning, you're gonna wanna pile on that reinforcement so that they know that behavior's good. But 
you do need to back off on it so that they're not only doing it for the reinforcement all the time. Does that make sense? All right. Again, I like to bring back to here, we reinforce behavior, not people. Again, we're not going to give a lollipop or whatever you use as reinforcement. I'm not advocating reinforcement of any type. But um, it's not because the child's a good kid. It's because this specific behavior. Now, I'm not saying you can't. You, you absolutely give your child love. Love is unconditional, right? And sometimes you give toys and fun things and things like that that aren't reinforcement. That's just you being a parent or you loving your child, and those are, those are okay. But we're not calling that reinforcement. When it's reinforcement, it's following a behavior if we're trying to change that behavior. There's something called shaping. So if I said to you, do a back handspring, and I'll give you a million dollars. Go ahead. Yeah, it's not in your repertoire, isn't it? One of these days, I'm going to find somebody, and it is. I'm going to be in trouble. Um, not in her repertoire. It's not her fault. She can't do it. Like, a million dollars, right? That's a lot of money. You want a million dollars, don't you? But she can't physically do a back handspring. There are a lot of things that you're kid. Clean your room. I, you will get to go to Chuck E. Cheese's if you clean your room. I can't clean my room. That's too hard. Um, but I can pick up that one sock, and I can put it there, right? And I can pick up that one book, and I can put it there so that I can start shaping the behavior. The same thing is with speech. Sometimes we do this with speech. We'll do um, like bubbles. A lot of kids like bubbles. Anybody's kids like bubbles? Anyway, we'll blow the bubbles. And then I'll stop and I'll wait for the kid to say buh. And if the kids say, you know, uh, well, I'll teach them buh. But they'll get buh. And then, but after a while, I'm like, nah, buh's not doing it. I got to have buh, buh, right? Because that's closer to bubbles. That's a closer approximation. So I'm going to shape it. I'm going to start out with the easier thing. We're going to make it just a little bit harder, a little bit harder, a little bit harder. I'm going to expect a little more so that you can get to that behavior. And maybe with you, maybe I could teach you to kind of maybe jump first. And then, I don't know, I probably could never teach you to do it. I couldn't teach you to do a back handspring. But just because something's not in my repertoire, first of all, we have to realize when things aren't in our kids' repertoires or our adults, right? And when we're asking them to do something that they just cannot do, there's that. But maybe they can do it later with the right teaching. One of the, uh, another example I have is my son, my son who has autism, he's 12 now, but when he was in first grade, he, they were complaining about him because he knew math, but he couldn't, he wouldn't count up. If they said, what's four plus four, he would go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and they wanted him to go four, five, six, seven, eight. He's like, he can't count up, he can't count up, right? And so they were trying to teach the whole skill as a whole together. And all, and I took a half an hour and broke it down. I think I told him, I said, um, I was, I say, what's four plus four? And I, and I teach him to just say the first number, four. So he'd just say that number four. And then the next thing is, that what's four plus four? And he'd say four, and then he'd, you know, start adding to it. So we taught it to him in steps. I think it took a half an hour. He went back to school and he could count up. And they were amazed. It was magic. It wasn't magic. It was shaping. We, it, it, he couldn't do that. It was just too much information they were giving him. We taught it in the different steps. And then lo and behold, he can do it. There are probably a lot of things that your kids can do that you don't realize they can do that if you just sort of shaped that behavior into something better, they would be able to get to. Um, I think I just talked about that. So we talked about consequence strategies. Those are things that happen after the behavior. But then we have this antecedent that happens before the behavior. And there, um, this is our behavior chain, remember. There are two types of antecedent variables that are important here. One is falls under motivation, or a setting event, or um, a motivating operation. Um, if you were using a cookie as a reinforcer and I am not hungry, that cookie is not as reinforcing than if I was hungry, right? So the state that I'm in is going to have, um, a, or a break as a reinforcer and I'm tired. If I'm not tired, maybe that break is not as reinforcing. So sometimes things are more reinforcing and sometimes things are less reinforcing. So it's good to understand that that's what, well, the cookie worked yesterday. Maybe they don't want the cookie today, right? We need to change it up. But then there are these signals. And that's what we were talking about with how smart your kids are and understanding that signals say it's OK to do something in this environment and not OK to do something in that environment. Um, pick up your phone. It's like put it to your head, yeah. So why did she do that? Because well, I told her who. Like, you wouldn't do that unless it rang or unless somebody told you to, right? You wouldn't just randomly pick up your phone or unless maybe you were trying to pretend you were busy. I don't know. But, you, that's a signal. That phone that, you know, you don't stop in the middle of the intersection unless you see the red light, right? Those are all signals that we get, okay, it, that if we do this behavior, then we'll get reinforcement. Same thing for your kids. Um, we had some people last time, they were saying, what's going on? Um, my child hits the mother, but not the father. 
or vice versa. It's like, well, what? You know, there's got to be some sort of a signal to that child that if I hit mom, I'm going to get what I want. But you know, that doesn't work with dad. There's something going on. They really, everybody picks up on this. I'm amazed that even children with, um, just they pick up on this so well. They, 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 they discriminate really well. So you can use this to your advantage if you understand that the signals that you can set up in the environment are going to make behaviors more or less likely to happen. Um, whoops. Prompting. Who uses prompting? Nobody? Nobody prompts their child? Yeah, somebody uses prompting. Who feels like their child or their adult is um, prompt dependent? They won't do anything unless you prompt them to do it. Yeah, that happens a lot because prompting is a really dangerous tool. Prompting is awesome because sometimes if um, you don't, if um, I don't have something in my repertoire. Like if I don't know how to touch six or find, you know, find six, maybe you need to prompt me to show me which one six is so that I can learn, right? It's a teaching tool. But eventually you need to actually systematically back off on that prompting. Otherwise, you can become prompt dependent. There are kids that I know that will not eat until somebody says it's time to eat. They won't eat on their own. And that's because everything was done with a prompt. So anytime you think about prompting your child or putting in that prompt to learn that new skill, Think about how you're going to get out of it. Think about how they're going to do that independently, because the goal is always to do it independently. Now, there's some things that people are not going to be able to do independently. They're just, they're just some things. And so those, you may just have to prompt indefinitely. But a lot of things, you'd be surprised, a lot of things can be done independently. One way of backing off on those prompts is to not use vocal prompts as often. How am I doing? Oh, not so well. Um, is to not use your, sorry. I'm going to have time for questions. We're going to, we're, I'm going to run through this. But um, just to let you know that vocal prompts, if you're always telling your child what to do, that's really, really hard to fade. They're going to wait for your signal. They're going to wait for your voice. Um, if you use pictures or gestural prompts or things like that, that's a lot easier to fade and get them to closer to independence. I'm not going to talk about that then. Um, I just talked about that. Another thing is, don't, is, is talking too much. Um, if I want something, if I want that water bottle from you and I say, hey, can I have that, sweetie? And no, she's like, no, she doesn't want it. That, I can't now take it from you, even if what I really meant is you can't have that right now. I need to tell, yeah, so with you, what I need to do is say, my turn. Because you can't, because if you're telling somebody something, you're confusing them half the time. If you've got somebody who has limited language and you're saying, oh, can I have that? And the answer is no. Then you don't want to teach them to say, when I say no, I'm still going to do it anyway. That's not a good skill to learn. Um, so say what you mean. Make sure you, a lot of times we think we're being nicer to say, hey, is it OK if I have that? Or let me have that. Um, and I know you get a lot of, into a lot of struggles with, with kids and having things. Um, just tell them, you know what, it's my turn. And then it'll be your turn. <laughs> but if you mean it, if you can't, you know, if you're going to say what you mean. And then you may need to follow through, too. You may need to somehow take it from them so they realize what you say is what you say, so they, you're not doing it 100 times. Give me that, give me that, give me that. Because then you might teach them, oh, mom doesn't really mean it until the fifth time. No, I mean it the first time. And you've taught that. If your child's doing that, it's because we've taught them that. Um, this is the last thing I'm going to kind of talk about real quick is um, task analysis is a really great thing. So if you have a kid who, can't, who isn't going to the bathroom independently, and it's not because of a physical motor difficulty. They physically can. It's just that they're not able to go through all the steps. Sometimes teaching it by step. If you just go through, or tying your shoes. You know, tying your shoes is a really hard one. But if you just teach the steps individually, and you prompt some steps, and then you fade away on those prompts, you can get it. So if, you th if you're going to make a task analysis, what you do is you've got to think about how you do it and just kind of write down all the steps. Sometimes when I do this as a larger workshop, we work on these kind of things. But you'd be amazed at how many skills you can actually teach somebody to do by doing a task analysis, by running them through, making your bed, cleaning your room. Again, is a really, cleaning room, that's a really hard thing to do. But I can do the little steps in between. Visuals. Look on the internet. Visuals are everywhere. Visual, who uses visuals with their child or with their adult? Nobody? OK, somebody. Because those are, that's it. all on your phone. Visual, I cannot underestimate the power of visuals. Um, so I want to, the last thing I want to do, so we talked a little bit today about some of the behaviors that you see. And I know in an hour, really, we had an hour. Um, we can't get through to a lot of them. And I hope you understand that 
Not that there's a magic bullet, but if you understand the function of the behavior and you understand that what you do after the behavior or what other people do after the behavior or what happens after the behavior determines whether that behavior is going to happen more often or less often in the future, if you can kind of get your head around that as you watch behavior, you'll see that makes a big difference. But a lot of times there are things that you can't treat, right? You're, you're like, I'm stumped. Feeding is a big one. There are a lot of people with, uh, feeding's a hard one. So we can't expect parents to be able to, to do all the feeding stuff. I want to give you some resources for who you can call if you want somebody to work with you to do some behavior analysis. Um, so to be kind of a behavior analyst, to let you know, most states um, actually do license their behavior analysts now, which is good. So there's a lot of overseeing because there's some people who say, yeah, I do this, and they're really not trained. They're really doing something else. And um, that's when we get, uh, we, we hear a lot of, oh, behavior analysis doesn't work. And then you ask them what really happened. I'm like, that was not behavior analysis. <laughs> I don't know what they were teaching your child to do, but that sounds really scary. You don't want that. Um, you can find a license. I'm licensed in the state of Virginia. You can usually look it up. Um, but there's also this thing here. Um, there's no one who is certified, who is not certified, excuse me, is allowed to call him or herself a certified, a board certified behavior analyst. So that's against the law. So if they're saying they're board certified and you look them up and they're not, they're not. <laughs> they shouldn't be doing that, but they're not, they're not allowed to do that. There's a listing there. So it's www.bacb.com. And you can put in your zip code and you can find somebody in your area. The problem is, who's going to pay? Um, right now, in many states, most states have autism laws. The autism people are really loud. You know, they're very, they're very good at advocacy. If you want to look at um, how to do advocacy, look over at the autism folks, because man, they're good at it. And they've gotten a lot of laws passed so that behavior analysis is covered, because there's so much research that shows the, the, effic the effic effic efficacy of it, excuse me. Um, when you have other disabilities that aren't, um, that don't have that with them, it's harder for politicians to make that decision to say, yeah, you need to be covered too. As behavior analysts, we are working to change that in a lot of states. I know in Virginia, we're trying to become licensed mental health professionals so that we can help everybody, that it's not just based on, your, I mean, you've got to have a reason for that. There's got to be a medical necessity. You may find more luck with Medicaid if, you have, uh, if your child's covered under Medicaid. Um, they, they may be able to work out medical necessity if they find that these behaviors are really interfering with their function and they're really interfering with their life. Um, Social, I hear like some social workers or some maybe community services boards have money that can help you. Uh, the ARC is a really good advocacy organization that can kind of help you find money, and it's going to differ by state, so I think that's so much about that. But um, those are my final thoughts, and I did want to leave a little time for, is this what you guys were looking for? Is this what you guys, does this make sense to you? Did I teach anybody anything about behavior? I hope I explained a little bit. That's good. Is there another question or another, um, um, anybody want to bring up another behavior we can talk about? <laughs>